The next item of business is a debate on motion 9888 in the name of James Kelly on protecting public services. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on James Kelly to speak to and move the motion. 12 minutes please Mr Kelly. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer and I move the motion in my name and let me be clear at the outset that Scottish Labour has no confidence in the draft budget brought forward by Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, last, last month. We can't have any confidence in a budget that is neither progressive or fair, that piles the agony and piles the pain on to local communities. It also, is also weak and incompetent on tax and lacks transparency in relation to pay policy. So it is not fit for purpose and as such uh, we declare that Mr Mackay needs to change that budget dramatically if it is to fill the gaps that exist in Scotland's communities because of the lack of funding. Uh, let me make some progress Mr Mason. I think if you look at a, a, as an example at the way that local councils have been penalised not just in this year's budget, but since 2011. Cumulatively, £1.5 billion of cuts. The spice note uh, re relates the fact that in this year's budget, an additional £135 million of cuts is added to that total. And it leaves a black hole in local government funding of up to £700 million. And councils are now starting the job are beginning to assess their budgets and look at the implications that have been passed down from Mr Mackay's draft budget. If you take South Lanarkshire for example, they're looking at proposed cuts of £23.5 million and that includes cutting of library services and a reduction, proposed reduction of 225 jobs. These are the real decisions that local councils are faced with, the real pain that they're having to face up to. Here in Edinburgh, proposed £24 million of cuts, including reduction in leisure facilities. In last week's debate on sport, looking at the prospect of Glasgow 2018 uh, and also the, the feeder venues, which included the Commonwealth Pool in Edinburgh, the government, uh, across and, uh, and shared by other uh, opposition parties, talked up the opportunity of the forthcoming games. But how can you get the advantage from that if you're cutting leisure facilities uh, in Edinburgh? In Clack Manninshire, we see uh, proposed cuts of £10 million, and that includes reductions uh, in teachers and classroom assistants, draining away that critical support for education, which is absolutely vital. Mr Mason, I'll take your intervention now. John Mason. Well, I appreciate it very much. Uh, since I tried to intervene, uh, the member has mentioned £700 million. Could you spell out for us how he would raise this £700 million? Which, would there be cuts elsewhere or is it increased taxes? James Kelly. Uh, having seen what a mess the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary made of his uh, tax proposals, Labour will take adequate time in, ob in order to... This, this is a... This is a three-stage budget process. We're in... We're in the first phase. And, uh, and we will publish in full our tax proposals ahead of the stage one debate. That is a perfectly reasonable, perfectly reasonable position to take as part of the budget process. And we will do so because we know we're beginning to see the pain that local communities are going to have to suffer. We, we're going to see the reductions in teacher numbers the closure of leisure facilities. So these are really serious points that have to be considered. And of course, 
Of course it needs... Of course it needs adequate and substantial changes in taxation, not the weak proposals that have been brought forward by Derek Mackay. Because if you look at the Fraser of Allender Institute, once the uh, business rate offsets are taken into account and the social, uh, the, the social security changes, there's only £28 million that's actually avail available uh, for allocation in other budget areas. As the STUC have pointed out, that's inadequate, it's weak. That's a not enough to face up to the challenges that we have. The STUC told the Finance Committee that the gaps in the budget mean that there's at least a £500 million uh, shortfall. So we need to step up to the mark. And the proposals that you have come forward with, Mr Mackay, uh, are simply not good enough. And the point I would also make um, to the Greens in that regard, who are obviously involved in negotiations with the government, if the scale, if the scale, if the scale of those, if what's required to fill those cuts is going to be at least £500 million, then I hope that the Greens aren't going to be bought off by, the, by a smaller, by a, a smaller sum, not at this time, than, than we saw last year. In addition to that, the tax plans brought forward by Derek Mackay uh, are riddled with loopholes. For example, those earning between 43,525 and 58,500 will actually pay less tax this year than they did last year. How can that be right? How can it be right that a nurse earning £33,000 will pay more tax uh, this year, yet a civil servant will pay less tax. That is, that is not only unfair, it's actually incompetent in terms of tax proposals. The other point is that when Mr Mackay published uh, his, uh, his, his scenarios for tax uh, back in the, in the autumn, one of the tests for these tax plans is that they should be able to uh, tackle austerity and stop the cuts. And quite clearly it has failed to do that if you've only got £28 million available to stop the cuts. And part of the reason for that is once more and again, in looking at the top rate, uh, the, 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 rate is, the top rate is only going to be 46 pence. Once more and again, Mr Mackay has backed away from asking those at the top rate to pay 50 pence. Not unreasonable when people are earning more than £150,000. So these, these tax proposals uh, are weak, they're not fit for purpose, and they don't meet the test of being either uh, progressive or stopping the cuts. I think the other point that I would make in terms... No, no, thank you. I think the other point that I would make in terms of uh, support for public services. The, cons the Conservatives make the point uh, in their, um, the, their amendment about the importance of uh, growing the economy. And I would argue that support for public services is absolutely vital uh, to growing the economy. Because if we're, going to, uh, if we're going to invest in education, we need to support education rather than reducing those teacher numbers and classroom assistance that we see in Clark Manninshire. If we're going to tackle that, then we need proper investment in education. If we're going to give our kids uh, and our college students the proper support that they need, the infrastructure, the teachers, the lecturers, the proper information, to, uh, in, information technology, in order to get them best qualified to meet the engineering and information technology gaps that exist in our, econ uh, our economy. Yeah, I'll take the intervention. Ash Denham. I thank the member for taking that intervention. I have to say I'm genuinely puzzled. Labour has had the same opportunity as all the other opposition parties in this chamber to engage constructively with the finance secretary and to bring forward their proposals, to make suggestions, to make um, choices that they would put forward. Why not engage with that process instead of a parliamentary stunt such as this? Yeah. 
James Kelly. This is not a parliamentary stunt. This is about. This is about. This is about setting out the very serious point that we want a budget. We want a budget that protects public services, that protects jobs in the community, that supports education and makes a real difference. What we're going to have from, I mean, Mr. Gibson wanted to intervene earlier. Mr. Gibson, Mr. Gibson, Mr. Mr. Gibson is an MSP. This, he's going for seven in a row. This is going to be the seventh budget in a row from the SNP that is going to reduce funding for council services. And what I, what I want to you know is when our SNP MSPs like Kenny Gibson and John Mason and James Dornan going to start standing up for their local communities instead of selling the jerseys. What's the point of coming to this parliament and supposedly representing your constituents when it comes to budget time and you vote year after year after year for cuts? No, thank you, Mr. Gibson. So I make the. So, so I. Excuse me, Mr. Kelly. So I make the point. Mr. Kelly, excuse me. Mr. Kelly's in his last minute. Can we stop the raucousness? And listen to Mr. Kelly's closing remarks, please. Mr. Kelly. So I make the point as we embark on the remainder of the, the budget process. The Labour want to see a budget that's serious about tackling that black hole in public in public service. We, only, we also want to see a budget that's transparent and serious. Excuse about me, Mr. Kelly. The issue. Excuse me, Mr. Kelly. May I ask for some peace and quiet, please? You can have another minute, Mr. Kelly. It's serious about tackling the issue of public sector pay. When Derek Mackay appeared at the Finance Committee on Monday, he couldn't tell us the cost of the public sector pay policy, and he couldn't tell us how it was allocated in the local, in the local government budget. That's, that's not even transparent. It's not even competent. And we also want to see action to address the fact that we've got over a quarter of a million children in child poverty. An absolute scandal in modern Scotland. So in summing up, in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, let's not have a seventh, the seventh year in a row when local councils and public services are penalised. Let's have a fair settlement for, it, for our communities. We don't have any confidence in this budget. It's time to stop the rot, reject the, reject the draft budget and stand up for local communities. I call Derek Mackay to speak to you and move Amendment 9888.1. Eight minutes, please, Mr Mackay. Well, presiding officer, I think as parliamentary stunts go, that was about as woeful as I have ever seen in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament. I think rather than asking, I think rather than asking questions of the confidence of the Scottish Government's budget, what that presentation does is ask questions of the confidence in the Labour Party to deliver alternatives or to be able to construct an argument in which they can engage positively uh, in the budget process. There is a well-established budget process in which opposition parties can engage. And uh, James Kelly you know, in, tried to insult the Green Party for engaging in those discussions. Is it not for all parliamentarians to engage in budget yeah, discussions? Yeah. The draft yeah. budget process is about the government presenting its position, recognising that this is a parliament of minorities where we must work across the chamber to find compromise and consensus to give, yes, stimulus, yes, sustainability for our public services, eh, but also, crucially, stability. I think the public expect no less from the opposition and the government. And I have taken, and I, uh, of course. James Kelly. Thank Mr Mackay for taking the intervention. Does he think the, the public expects you to deliver a budget which will result in local councils 
having to make cuts in the local area. Derek Mackay. The budget serves to invest uh, hundreds of millions of pounds more in our public services right across the public sector. That's what the public expect. And deploying our tax powers, I set out four tests, including protecting the economy, using the system in a more progressive fashion, protecting lower income earners, and investing in public services uh, as well. I should say of the Labour Party, I thought it was quite a consultative and collaborative approach that we engaged in, in terms of the deployment of our income tax uh, powers. Uh, so much we invited opposition parties to give us uh, the policies that they would have us cost so that we could have a fair uh, and balanced uh, debate uh, in that. I didn't receive any proposals for the Labour Party, to be fair, uh, the party was embarking in a leadership uh, contest uh, thereabout and still the people of Scotland are waiting to hear what the Labour Party's alternative is uh, specifically on income tax. So I would argue the people of Scotland have no confidence in a Labour opposition that fails to work constructively when the opportunity is given to them. I make the invitation again. My door is open to any opposition party who wishes to discuss the budget uh, going uh, forward. It is a fact of course. Mike Rumbles. Uh, this time last year, the Greens claimed to have won a concession of £150 million from the Scottish budget. And I just wonder if you could remind the Chamber if that was the case and where that £150 million came from? Derek Mackay. I, I really don't see how that's relevant to this discussion. But what we were able to do is to be able to strike a deal that allowed for us to take forward budget amendments as part of the process before stage three. And I think that that was very welcomed uh, and orderly. You see, this uh, government is trying to deliver the budget in an orderly fashion. The Labour Party returned to the top rate of tax. And as I said in the presentation of the draft budget on the 14th of December, that our income tax policy uh, is intended to raise more money for public services in relation to the top rate of tax, which James Kelly has raised again their proposition would raise less money next year for Scotland's public services uh, based on raising uh, the top rate of tax uh, above the level uh, that the Scottish Government proposes. Uh, but let's uh, not forget the Tories' role in this as well. Over the 10 years to 2019-20, Conservative austerity will mean that the Scottish Government fiscal block grant allocation will have been reduced in real terms by £2.6 billion pounds, and by 2019-20 the resource block grant will be around £500 million pounds lower in real terms than in 2017-18. Uh, so our balanced and progressive budget proposals protect our public services from that reduction in real terms uh, to Scotland, ensuring that there's a real terms growth for Scotland's uh, public uh, service. If I can just make a bit more progress uh, in terms of my uh, contribution, because what that budget means is additional resources, for example, for the National Health Service, uh, more than £400 million pounds more uh, for the NHS. And in terms of local government, which has been referenced, yes, if they use their council tax powers up to 3%, that puts the local government uh, arrangements in real terms growth as well. Well, having protected the cash settlement and growing the capital settlement uh, also. Now, I think it's significant to know that even Coslet, uh, I think it was the local government committee said that even Cosla do not think they are calling for an extra £500 million pounds explicitly. Let me uh, make a little more um, progress to say a bit more about what the budget does for public services, which essentially is what this uh, debate is about. Far short in terms of the wording of the motion, I have to say a vote of no confidence, it's actually a motion about public services. We've invested more in real terms in police and fire to the extent, of course, that they can recover VAT as well and enhance their spending power. More support for colleges and universities in terms of a real terms increase. And yes, a progressive pay policy that does as we said we would and lift the 1% pay cap and a far more progressive policy uh, than that which exists south of uh, the border. So I think it gives support to our public services and also those that work uh, within it. The budget is uh, about fairness, it's about delivery as well, £750 million pounds for new affordable homes, more for energy efficiency, more specifically around mitigation of the welfare reforms coming from the UK government, more for ending homelessness uh, together fund, more for attacking uh, the attainment gap in Scotland and supporting our frontline education service, more for supporting uh, the child uh, poverty uh, efforts. And as I say, all of that should ensure that we live in a fairer society 
society. Extra investment in all these areas, uh, whilst ensuring our tax plans are uh, fair and progressive, and allow us to be the lowest tax part of the UK, but in a progressive fashion. Um, I'll take Alec Rowley now. Alex Rowley. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. This week, Audit Scotland uh, published a report on Clarkmanninshire Council, which is an annual revenue budget of £118 million. They say that that council has to take £29 million out of its budget over the next three years. Unless he changes policy, then that council will collapse. Does he agree that he needs to look again at the local government settlement? Derek Mackay. I, th I think I've said, I think I've said over the course of this debate, and I've said publicly that I'll engage with all political parties to find a compromise so that a budget can pass. I think it's a fair settlement to local government. But I want to make this point as well. The Labour Party has stopped talking about the National Health Service. This government is proposing to invest over £400 million more for the NHS. That's not matched by the Labour Party, who seem to have forgotten about the National Health Service when it comes to the budget um, settlement. A fairer income tax policy as well, more investment in infrastructure, some £4 billion for investment in infrastructure to help us grow our economy in an inclusive uh, way. But uh, you know, a well-performing uh, economy is a prerequisite uh, for ensuring that we have high-quality public services so we can invest in our public services. And many of the interventions are to support economic growth and deliver that inclusive growth as well. Whether it's early learning and expanding childcare, affordable houses, expanding infrastructure, both transport, connectivity, a digital and the environmental agenda as well, for example, more electric charging points. All of that is substantial new investment by this government, all reasons to support this budget whilst engaging. I have to work with other parties to reach a mature decision about what is right for our country and I would invite all political parties to act constructively and maturely in that regard. Could you move the amendment please, Cabinet Secretary? The amendment my name. I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 9888.4. Seven minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I start by uh, welcoming James Kelly to his place on the front bench as Labour's uh, relatively new finance uh, spokesman? And I hope you'll, you'll forgive me when I say we, we feel a little bit short-changed on this side of the chamber because we were led to believe last week that uh, Richard Leonard would be leading uh, this debate uh, this afternoon. And we were looking forward to hearing this 21st century Arthur Scargill, uh, entrancing, entrancing the chamber with his rhetoric. So I'm, I'm, we're feeling a little bit shortchanged, uh, I'm afraid, this afternoon. But maybe it's no surprise that Mr. Leonard is taking a back seat for uh, this debate because perhaps he read today's poll in The Times, uh, the YouGov poll showing that uh, the Labour Party in Scotland have slipped uh, from second to third place in Holyrood voting intentions, whilst a staggering 60% of the electorate have no opinion whatsoever on Mr. Leonard. So he needs to work a little harder on his public profile. And I think he would have welcomed the chance to have led this debate so the public would be aware of what he has uh, to say to them. Uh, in the words of the song, Deputy Presiding Officer, things can only get better uh, for Scottish Labour. Now, the Labour Party have brought us today a debate on the Scottish budget. And while they are quite entitled to choose whatever subject they want for their debating time, it does seem a bit curious to be scheduling this debate just two weeks before stage one of the budget. Uh, and I have some sympathy for the, the points made by the uh, Cabinet Secretary. That if, if the Labour Party really wants to be serious about influencing the direction of the budget, it is quite entitled to sit down and make a case to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance as to what, what changes it wants to make. And I really think Mr Kelly would have been in stronger ground had he come to the Chamber today and set out not only what additional spending the Labour Party wants to see, but also set out the tax changes they would make to pay for it. So we could all discuss that in the round. In terms of the basic motion put forward by the Labour Party, it's hard to disagree with that basic proposition because the budget we have presented to us, the draft budget, does fail to protect public services. Now, James Kelly was right to say the local government has been the loser from the draft budget. There has been a real terms cut in total central government funding for local authorities of 80 million, 81 million pounds from this year to the next. And more significantly, local authority distributable revenue grant has been cut by more than 200 million. 
And even if councils were to raise council tax by the maximum of 3% from this year to the next, this would only offset that rise by less than half, about £75 million. So overall, councils have seen their revenue funding from Scottish Government cut in real terms by 7.6% between 2010-11 and 2016-17, far above any reduction in the Scottish Government's own discretionary spending budget in that same period. And the consequences of this will be known to us all because local authorities across the country looking to set their budgets are having to look at making savings across the board, closing schools, reducing the number of teachers, cutting arts and leisure programmes, reducing road and green space maintenance, and in some cases, increasing user charges for various council services. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, councils are under pressure to increase staff salaries. The Scottish Government's pay policy proposes... Let, let, let me make this point and I will, I'll go away. The Scottish Government's pay policy proposes a 3% rise for those earning up to £30,000 and a 2% rise for those above it. And not surprisingly, the unions representing local authority workers believe that staff there should be getting the same rise. Indeed, they made the case last week for a 6% increase. And yet, the Finance Secretary's draft budget contains no additional sums for salary increases to match what he is paying elsewhere in the public sector. I'll give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Derek Mackay. If the Conservative position is to argue for more resources for these areas, how does it propose to balance that with the fact that if I was to follow Tory tax policies, we'd have to find a further £501 million? Pounds? Margaret Fraser. Well, first of all, the Cabinet Secretary's sums are wrong. Secondly, the Cabinet Secretary has more money to spend because the Scottish Government's budget, according to both Spice and Fraser Vallander, is increasing in real terms from this year to the next. Indeed, the Finance Secretary explicitly accepted that point in the Finance Committee last week when I put it to him. And while the Scottish Government will complain that relative to the previous high point of 2010, their discretionary spending has been reduced, Fraser Vallander state that that reduction is some 3.8%, well below the 8% figure often quoted by the SNP. But more significantly, if we compare spending today with what it was 10 years ago when the SNP came to power, we find that, again, according to Fraser Vallander, there has been no real terms reduction in the Scottish Government's discretionary spending. Uh, well, if he wants to contradict Fraser Vallander, I'll be interested to hear that from him. It's Derek Mackay. It's more I'm actually stunned that Murdo Fraser doesn't know the point that I'm making, which is that if I follow Tory tax policy for the next financial year, it results in £501 million less. Irrespective of an argument over historic reductions, this is about what we propose for the next financial year if I followed their tax policies. You can't have it both ways, raise less and spend more. Murdo Fraser. Well, that's a very curious intervention to get from the Cabinet Secretary. Because for years we sat in this chamber and we listened to people on the SNP benches, Mr Salmon among them, telling us that the way to grow the tax take was to grow the economy. Yeah. That was the way to get more money for public services. We remember Mr Salmon arguing for cuts in corporation tax to grow the economy. Mr, Mr. Mackay himself just produced an excellent paper just before Christmas, arguing for tax cuts to grow the economy. He argued if you cut air departure tax, that would grow the economy, it would grow tax revenues. Why can he not see the logic of his own party's position and his own argument when it comes to the broader economy? Instead of increasing taxes, let's reduce them and grow the tax take. And at the same time, of course, if we cut out waste, if we cut out the unnecessary vanity projects from the SNP, if we scrap the name person policy, think how much money we would save from all that in addition. So any cuts, any cuts the Scottish Government are making are entirely of their own uh, choice. So, uh, presiding officer, I appreciate my time is almost at an end. The SNP's approach to the budget is not just to cut local services, but to increase tax. Despite promising at the last Scottish election, they would not increase tax for those paying the basic rate. That is exactly what they are planning to do. So the Scots are facing a double whammy. Their taxes are going up at the same time as services being cut. Under the SNP, we are asked to pay more, but we get less in return. Presiding officer, in contrast, we are quite clear about what we want from the budget. There's no case for tax rises, particularly when promises have been made that they should not go up, and when the budget actually, in terms of the block grant, is increasing. What this budget should be doing is cutting waste and growing the economy so tax revenues rise. That is what we're saying in our amendment today 
and I have pleasure in moving it. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey to speak to and move amendment 9888.3. Six minutes, please, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I uh, welcome the opportunity to have this debate. Uh, I, I was going to reflect on the fact that it's uh, perhaps the second half of the stage zero process in the budget, because, of course, uh, Mardo Fraser will remember that the Conservatives brought uh, a motion the day before the draft budget was published. So it, it did strike me as a little odd that he says it's curious that the Labour Party choose to debate this two weeks uh, before the, the, the budget itself is voted on at stage one. I think it's fair enough to have a little advanced debate, whether uh, before the budget's published or before it's voted on formally. Fair enough if we use that opportunity properly. Budget scrutiny has been shorter in recent years than it ought to be, uh, and so additional time in the chamber is helpful if we put it to good use. There's a lot that we could gain from more debate on how we fund our public services, as well as other aspects uh, which are often under-examined, like the carbon assessment progress, or the shortcomings that the finance secretary admits exist on issues like gender budgeting, and I would commend the written submission from the Scottish Women's Budget Group and the serious criticism that it makes, some of which the Cabinet Secretary accepted uh, in the discussion with the committee this week. But I do have to ask the Labour Party today, and I, I really want to ask this in a constructive spirit, are they using this opportunity, or indeed the wider opportunity that comes from a period of minority government to best effect? Two weeks before stage one, we ought to be at a point where opposition parties are putting forward positive, constructive ideas to the government which can make the budget better. <laughs> government, then, government then needs uh, its time to conduct its own scrutiny as well as uh, the Fiscal Commission scrutiny, uh, and then uh, we can all look at the, the parliamentary scrutiny of those proposals. Producing tax proposals after the budget bill has reached stage one won't give any time actually to change the budget for the better and see a positive effect. Mike Rumbles. I thank Patrick Harvey for giving way. Earlier I asked the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance whether he could tell us the £150 million pounds this time last year that Patrick Harvey claims he received uh, from the Scottish Government where that money came from. He couldn't tell the Chamber. I wonder if Patrick Harvey could take the opportunity to tell the Chamber where this £150 million pounds came from. Patrick Harvey. Well, I'm, I'm happy to ask my office to send uh, Mr Rumbles the links to all of the formal discussions, which he was very well aware of at the time. £160 million pounds of cuts to local government reversed. Uh, I think I'm right in saying the only stage two amendment of its process since devolution, and certainly the biggest budget concession since devolution. Look, we're being asked today to vote on the draft budget instead of debating changes to the real thing. And I can't disagree with a word uh, in the Labour Party motion itself, but everybody here is aware, everybody here is aware that that draft is just that. The purpose of a draft is for the government to put forward its proposals so that we can all challenge them and examine them. And the vote that actually matters is the vote on the actual budget bill that will be introduced and on the rate resolution in February. Labour's rhetoric uh, around today's debate, billing as a vote of no confidence in the budget before this committee scrutiny has even been completed, sadly suggests to me that they have no more interest in actually improving this budget than they've shown in previous years. Last year, I challenged uh, Labour, uh, Labour's refusal to engage in that process properly, and maybe I did so too aggressively. If so, I apologise. So let me say now, more in sorrow than in anger, if Labour MSPs care about a better budget that protects our public services, they need to bring forward solutions that have been lacking so far. Monica Lennon. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I think James Kelly set out that we will do that, but doesn't Patrick Harvey agree there's an important principle at stake in this process? Because we have the Cabinet Secretary wanting to engage constructively, but he is denying that this draft budget will harm our public services. So we are simply asking for that recognition because the language that's been used is implying and stating that this is a fair settlement for local government, and it clearly isn't. 
Patrick Harvey. I certainly agree that what's in the draft budget is not a fair settlement for local government, but the draft budget does nothing. The real budget does something, and we need to seek changes to that. The Green approach has been very clear all along. Upfront, early engagement, being clear about our principles, which we took to our party conference to seek their democratic mandate for an approach that prioritised progressive changes to income tax, protection of public services, including at a local level, a fair public pay settlement and investment in low carbon infrastructure. The, the local government uh, impact is, is very clear. Of the, the increases and decreases in, in, in the draft budget previous, uh, compared with the previous year, local government gets the third biggest cut of any of the 30 odd areas uh, in this. Uh, and if we, if we look at the, the SPICE analysis, Depending on which pots of money you include and consider as part of the core settlement, one eight seven million pound cut, or a one three five million pound cut, or a one five seven million pound cut, and that last one is the closest to the comparison figure that we used last year. As well as that, we need to ensure that local government has the resources it needs for a fair uh, pay settlement. Presiding officer, the case for low carbon investment is also extremely urgent. Uh, the, the Liberal Democrat uh, uh, amendment mentions ferries. I, I think that their wording is perhaps premature, given that we haven't yet seen the relevant committee's recommendation. I'm aware that the committee have discussed it. That's not been published yet. And I expect the Cabinet Secretary to respond very clearly during this budget process to whatever the committee recommends on that issue. Uh, and we want to see progress as well on fuel poverty. He says there's more money for fuel poverty. Well, the, the fuel poverty and energy efficiency of the budget line goes from 114.1 million to an, yes, an incredibly course. impressive 114.3 million. Hardly the kind of increase that would reflect the you national must close, in, please, infrastructure priority that has apparently been placed in it. Presiding officer, we have put forward specific proposals to the government. They can choose either to work with us or work with any one of these other extremely constructive political parties, but they're going to have to make that choice soon, and I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 9888.2. Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move the amendment uh, in my name. Our, our general approach to budgets has been constructive and engaging. Since I've been leader, we've voted for the Scottish Government on two occasions. And as the Finance Secretary will know, we've always engaged in a constructive manner. We voted for the budget before because what we received was... Not perfect, but it was good enough. We had secured more investment for nursery education, for school meals, free school meals, but also for colleges. However, the approach this year has changed, and we deeply regret it, um, because we have engaged positively and constructively uh, with Derek Mackay in previous years. But this year, the approach is different, because in order to try and strong arm us into supporting the budget, he is using the significant issue for the Northern Isles of the ferries in order to secure our support for the whole budget, threatening to withdraw a clear commitment that he made to the Northern Isles to provide financial support for the internal ferries for those islands. And he's threatening to take away that commitment and that promise in order to try and secure our support. So we deeply regret that uh, approach, certainly, if he's going to Derek change his position. Uh, no, it's not a change in position because I was in attendance of all those meetings. The position is that we enter into meaningful negotiations with lo local authorities. It is a deep misunderstanding to suggest it was an automatic allocation of summer monies. But if I can answer Willie Rennie's point uh, on this, uh, Patrick Harvey's right that I understand that the issue of the ferries in the Northern Isles has been discussed at a uh, rec uh, committee. I haven't seen the report either, uh, but I will look at its recommendations and respond uh, in due course. Willie Rennie. Uh, well, there's two government documents here that are very, very clear about the government's promises, and it's talking about a negotiation now to conclude this issue. This was back in 2014 that this commitment was made, and nothing has changed since. So if the discussions are happening, I can't see any commitment to actually making them real and actually delivering on the promise. And the ferry services plan from 2012 was equally clear about resolving this injustice for the internal ferries. And the result is that public services will be cut or ferries will be cut. And that is the responsibility of Derek Mackay to come to terms with. And that's why we hope 
in when the final budget is published that we actually see a clear commitment to deliver on the promise that he made. So I hope there is going to be a change of tack because I would like to get back to the constructive and engaging process that we've had in previous years. Now, Liberal Democrats have been very clear, open and honest about our costed manifesto commitments. We said, unlike the government at the election, that we prepared to put a penny on income tax to invest in a transformational investment in education for nurseries, for schools and for colleges. We were frank with people so that when they went to vote in the ballot box, they knew, they knew what they were voting when they voted for us. Now, they weren't clear with the SNP because they said one thing and have done another since. But nevertheless, I welcome the fact that they now recognise that we need to use the powers that we have now gained in this parliament to make that transformational change. So we would urge the Scottish Government to go the full length of making a proper investment of £500 million. And we think it's £500 million is necessary in order to boost education because that benefits the economy and in the face of Brexit I agreed with much of what the, the First Minister was saying in her European paper on Monday when she set out the concerns about the economic impact of Brexit but when it comes to the budget we don't see any action to try and deal with that because we need to invest in the skills and talents of people in order to try and supply the skills for businesses to grow the wealth and opportunity in this country and that's why we think in nurseries, we should have a proper investment programme for the expansion of nursery education for two, three and four year olds, to make sure that we invest properly in school budgets and the pupil premium or the pupil equity fund, as the Scottish Government would call it, and to reverse the damaging cuts to colleges of recent years, the 150,000 places that were cut and that deprived opportunities for mature students and part-time students as well. So that's the investment that we think is necessary to try and get the Scottish education system back up to being the best in the world again. But we also need, secondly, to invest in mental health. And the last time round, in the last budget, we recommended that mental health spending should go up to £1.2 billion. And we need that significant extra investment in mental health because we have seen the large numbers of people that are having to wait to get essential mental health treatment. The young people who just cannot get the support they need. Some are waiting up to a year to get just the basic treatment and support that they need. We need, and we've seen it with the, one of the commanders for the police in Dundee, who has said mental health is one of the, the major issues that they now deal with in the police force in Dundee. And we need, therefore, to get investment into mental health to take the pressure off the police and the frontline services. So the kind of... And that, yes, I'll certainly take an intervention. Very quickly, Monica Lennon. Does Willie Rennie agree that if the Scottish Government properly invested in public services, that they could come round to agreeing with other parties who want to see school-based counselling and ask that Sam H have been reiterating this week? Willie Agreed. Rennie. It was a very interesting report this morning about um, first aid, mental health for schools, and I thought it was a good move in the right direction. That's the kind of thing that we could invest in. And then finally, on ferries, we need to see the commitment that the Government has made on ferries fulfilled. That's the best way of securing a constructive engagement across this chamber so we can agree a budget for Scotland. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of five minutes, please. Um, all the opening speeches went a, a wee bit over, so we're quite tight. Uh, James Dornan followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the, your last comment, then, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to be able to take any interventions, which, take it for me, I'm very, very upset about. I heard, uh, I, I got reported there that Mr Kelly and his uh, soon-to-be-famous, I suspect, uh, opening comments said something about me selling the jerseys when I came here on a regular basis. Can I assure you that the, the position I find myself in is I can only see one Arthur Daly party in this chamber, and that's the Labour Party, where they promise you something, and every single time they're in a position to give you it, they sell you a dud instead. Now, one of the downsides of growing old is seeing people and institutions you hold dear deteriorate. Family and loved ones who become ill and frail, film stars who end up on made-for-TV afternoon films, and football players who think they still have it, but don't. Old theatres and cinemas 
going to Iraq and ruin when you remember them in better days. Unfortunately, that is what we are witnessing here today. A once great institution, once held dear by me and many of my generation, shows itself to be a poor facsimile of the party whose name they dare to still use. While our budget has been cut in real terms from Westminster, the Labour Party would rather spend its time indulging in a stunt which uses our public service workers as a political football than work with the Scottish Government to ensure Scotland gets a fairer deal. That was not the Labour way. They used to defend the workers when they were in office, not use them when they were out of it. Hypocrisy is now a byword for Scottish Labour, I'm afraid. And it's clear that the Scottish Government recognises in this draft budget that public sector workers form an integral part of Scottish life. It also recognises our need for improved pay, especially in light of the increasing austerity measures coming out of Westminster. Social security cuts alongside rising inflation are causing real hardship to many of our lowest paid public sector workers. And this budget shows the Government's commitment to those hard-working staff members and to their families. I'm sorry, Jackie, I don't have time for one of your stories. This government recognises that even in the toughest of financial times, public services must be maintained and staff should be paid fairly in order for us to provide the people of Scotland with some of the best public services throughout the UK. But what is Labour's position outside of a press release? Now, I know Anis Sarwar is going to go up and he's going to speak about the NHS shortly. But before he does, just let me say three words to him. Labour controlled Wales. A very poorly run health service and a Labour Party which refuses to increase public sector pay unless they receive extra funding from Westminster. So let's get back to the hypocrisy again. There's no secret about pressures in the Scottish NHS that they've been vast, vast over this winter period. In fact, both the Cabinet Secretary and First Minister apologised unreservedly for any delays patients may have had to face. However, at no point was any blame apportioned to the hard-working staff of our NHS. That, presiding officer, is because this government genuinely supports and cares for our frontline staff. Let's just compare that attitude to the, to the new leader of Scottish Labour Party. And I'll quote a tweet he put out just last week. I'd like to hear your stories. He probably is the acting leader because I doubt he'll be there that long. Uh, I'd like to hear your stories, good, bad or indifferent of the experience you or a loved one have had with the NHS over winter. Now call me cynical, but I highly doubt that Mr Leonard will be coming to the chamber tomorrow to ask the First Minister how the Scottish NHS has managed to generate so many good news stories at such a difficult time across the UK. Now, I would suggest that Mr Leonard was using his political platform to fish for stories which he could use to beat the Scottish Government with. And can you imagine the audacity of a party that would bring a motion to this chamber claiming to stand up for our public service workers whilst at the same time fishing for ways in which to criticise and complain about the brilliant work being done under the most difficult of circumstances. It is beyond contempt. And maybe they should remind themselves of their own failings in the creation of the ruinous PFI system of fi local government finance. 93 Excuse PFI me, projects. Mr. Dornan, adding... uh, point of order, Jenny Mara. What's the bet it's not? Oh. Oh, I didn't catch that, Mr. Dornan, but please be quiet until we've heard the point of order. Point of order, Deputy Presiding Officer, can you advise the Chamber to what extent the member speaking has to stick to the motion up for debate and not simply use this time to attack another party who have brought a serious motion to debate this afternoon? That is the decision of whoever is presiding in the Chair, Ms Mara. Mr Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Maybe the party shouldn't have brought a motion that was solely to attack the government in the first place instead of taking part in the process. And as I said before I get interrupted, they should remind themselves of their own failings in the creation of the ruinous PFI system of finance. 93 PFI projects adding up to a staggering £30.2 billion, with contracts being repaid up to over 35 years at over five times the initial cost of projects. Must and I wonder how close, much of a please, pay rise that could have funded. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I would suggest that if the Labour Party think they can balance the books better, they would be best providing an amendment or indeed an alternative motion, one which does balance the books. Although in you saying that... You must going close, in, please, Mr Dornan. Going in previous performances, it seems much more likely they'll Mr. continue... Mr Dornan, would you please close? Thank you very so much. What about the...
the point of order. Mr Dornan, as I said already, that is entirely my decision. I've asked you to close. Thank you. And may we now have Ian Gray to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer. Of all public services uh, underpinned or perhaps undermined by this budget, arguably the most important is education. If there is a silver bullet in the fight against poverty, the struggle against inequality, or indeed the drive to grow the economy, then it is education. Across the years, so many have told us just that, from Mandela, who called it the most powerful weapon to change the world, to Malala, who said, one child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world and risked her life to learn. Education is not just a public service, it is a public good, an investment, an opportunity for our children and grandchildren and the future for us all. Our obligation then is to make the necessary public investment in it and to reject a budget which fails that test of principle, not just of detail. After all, the First Minister has told us so often this is her number one priority. She asks to be judged on it, but the evidence says she can't be trusted on it. Over the years, the SNP have cut spending per annum per secondary school pupil by £1,000, by £500 for pupils across our schools. Since 2010, £1.2 billion less has been spent in our schools than would have been had spending been simply maintained. Colleges too, years of cuts and flat cash settlements amount to, to real term cuts. While well, university students have seen grants slashed and their debt burden for living uh, support double. The effect uh, in our schools is real. Three and a half thousand fewer teachers, 4,000 from the core budget, a thousand fewer support staff, Average class sizes in primary schools are bigger than they have ever been. And we cannot recruit even these reduced teacher numbers. Hundreds of posts lie vacant, while every week we hear of unacceptable measures schools are taking to cope, whether it's begging parents to help out in the classroom, or unqualified students teaching a critical subject like maths right here in our capital city, in a school Trinity Academy with a proud record stretching back over 120 years. And the reason for this is not hard to find. Teachers' pay has eroded every year under this government. And another below inflation pay deal has just been awarded, another real terms cut. Our teachers have gone from amongst the best paid teachers in the developed world to well below average in that international league table. And of course, the most worrying effect of these cuts to this public service has been the decline in achievement in core skills such as numeracy and literacy falling behind other nations and a continuing gap between children from the richest families and the rest. The question then for this budget is does it reverse these trends in education and does it begin to undo 10 years of cuts? To do so, it would have to demonstrate adequate resources for local councils who fund our schools, not just to avoid further cuts, but to begin to rebuild core teaching and support staff numbers, to reverse the increase in class sizes, and to provide a pay increase sufficient to make teaching an attractive profession once again. Stuart Stevenson. Um, absolutely respect the, the member's experience as a teacher. You'll remember, of course, that in providing answers, pupils have to provide their workings as well as an answer. As he's provided neither yet, will he use his last minute to produce one or the other for us? Ian well, Gray. Well, with regard to the teacher's pay, the, the table from the OECD report can be found in the Times Educational Supplement, which I'm happy, which I'm happy to supply. With regard, with regard to the erosion of teacher's pay, uh, a, a teacher today uh, is earning around just under £6,000 less and I am ha than they would be had their pay kept pace with inflation. And I am more than happy to provide the working to Mr Stevenson, as would the EIS, I'm absolutely sure. This budget to protect education 
We'd have to restore cuts to grant support for students so that those who cannot ask their families to subsidise their living at university can afford to go without being put off by the scale of debt they face. Presiding officer, this budget does none of this. It leaves a, a, a shortfall effectively of £700 million for councils. So they will not even be able to stand still on schools, never mind restore teacher numbers and teachers' no, pay. Mr Gray is just closing. The tax measures which the uh, Cabinet Secretary has referred to raise only an additional £28 million and are so progressive that someone who earns £40,000 will pay less tax, but someone who you pays £40,000 will Mr. pay Gray. more. It provides no additional support for students and we see the consequences clear as councils prepare their budgets. What confidence can we have Mr. for this Gray, budget investing in education? None, none at all. That's why we should support the motion today. May I have Tom Arthur followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Uh, before highlighting a few of the ways in which I, I believe this draft budget does actually support our public services, I would like just to take a moment to remind Parliament of the economic and fiscal backdrop to the current process. The UK Government is cutting the Scottish Government's resource budget by £500 million over the next two years. This, of course, is the uh, budget that pays for the day-to-day -day running of our public services. This, of course, includes paying the salaries of public sector employees like nurses, firefighters and police officers. This £500 million budget reduction in itself should be also understood in the broader context of almost a decade of austerity implemented by the UK Government, which in itself represented a failure to effectively respond to the wake of the financial crash in 2008. As a consequence of misguided and dogmatic UK Government policy, we have endured a prolonged period of wage stagnation with real income growth suppressed and inequality rising. And presiding officer, all of this wage stagnation, the rise of insecure work and welfare cuts has been exacerbated by the huge economic imbalance between the South East and the rest of the UK. All of these systemic distortions and inequalities within the wider UK economy, combined with the anticipated headwinds resulting from Brexit, on top of a £500 million reduction in the resource element of the block grant, creates an extremely challenging environment in which to set a budget. This is a challenge, not only to the government, but to all of us in this place, which is, after all, a parliament of minorities. The draft budget, as laid before the parliament, in my view, represents a bold and innovative response to this challenge. In committing an additional £400 million to the NHS, it supports our most treasured public service. By increasing spending on educational attainment, it demonstrates the Scottish Government's commitment to reducing the attainment gap. Significant increases in the economy portfolio budget and continued support for small businesses show a government that is determined to support economic growth. And the allocation of additional funds to Creative Scotland in light of reductions from the national lottery have been welcomed from across Scotland's cultural sector. These represent but a handful of the provisions within the draft budget that will contribute towards protecting public services. Would the member give way? Certainly. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. The, the Cabinet Secretary has made the case that the tax policy changes he's proposing bring the overall Scottish Government budget back into real terms growth. Does the member have any idea why it's therefore impossible to provide real terms growth in the funding from Scottish Government to local government to protect those services? Tom Arthur. I, I thank Patrick Harvey uh, for, for that intervention. Um, and I think ultimately that's, that's a point I'm going to come on to later on in my remarks that comes fundamentally down to choices. And I'm sure he will continue to engage constructively with the Cabinet Secretary to make that case. But ultimately, funds being allocated to one area of spending mean less funds for another area. And that's something that he will have to advocate and it's a position that he'll have to put forward. And I say on that topic, uh, President Officer, today was an opportunity for Labour to table a motion setting out their priorities and visions for public services and for it to be subjected to the trial of parliamentary scrutiny. It is therefore uh, disappointing that James Kelly has chosen instead to frame this debate as a vote of no confidence in the draft budget. Just as with their unwillingness to engage constructively with the government ahead of the draft budget, the Labour front bench would rather chase, unfortunately, the easy headline 
and spare themselves the bother of the deep thinking and heavy lifting that making a meaningful contribution would require, as is sadly now the norm for that once great institution will choose easy gimmick. <laughs> they'll choose easy gimmicks over hard graft. <laughs> Turning to the Tories, I have to say it, it seems that they are having something of an identity crisis. Instinctively, they wish to slash taxes and high earners and shrink the state. But they're a devious lot of the Tories. And they know that such a view, I'm sorry, I've already taken one intervention. He's in his last time, minute. But they know that such a view is the minority. But they, then again, they know that to slash and burn is a minority position in Scotland. And we see them punished at the ballot box. So we end up with the unsustainable absurdity of the Tories simultaneously calling for tax cuts for the wealthy and increased public spending for a party which for a party which prides itself on straight talking common sense politics this is utterly pathetic so i say to the tories have the have the courage of your convictions if the tories believe that high earners such as msps should receive a tax cut then they should set out from where in the draft budget they will take the money to pay for it Will we take it from the £400 million pounds for the NHS? Close, Will it be please. from the £179 million pounds to raise attainment in our schools? Will it be from the £600 million pounds committed to the rollout of 100% access to super-fast broadband? Or will it be from you the must £100 close, million Mr. Pound the Scottish Government spends every year uh, mitigating Tory welfare cuts? Because I know this is a budget that works for all of Scotland, and I'm looking forward to backing it in the coming weeks. Alexander Stewart, followed by Claire Adamson. Deputy Presiding Officer, the sole purpose of taxation is to ensure that the public services are adequately funded. It would seem, however, that some people in this chamber need reminding that raising taxation also has consequences for individuals, for families, for businesses and for our economy as a whole. When we are making decisions about the level of tax, we have to balance the need to deliver excellent schools, effective hospitals with impact on our constituents' pay packets and on the nation's economy to grow. We in the Scottish Conservatives take the view that no one in Scotland should pay more in income tax as someone who's doing the same job in the United Kingdom. It's incredibly important that the levels of taxation remain competitive. Time is tight, I'd like to continue. So that both remain competitive and we retain talented individuals already in ensuring that they're contributing to the work and life and business that we have here. Putting up a sign at the border saying higher taxes here sends completely the wrong message. But it is not just uh, the Scottish Conservatives that are challenging the red, the orange, the yellow and the green. Huh? I will. Minister. I, I thank you very much for Alexander Stewart for taking uh, my intervention. Is it therefore not the case that you would welcome, particularly because it's in a progressive fashion, that actually for a majority of taxpayers, in Scotland, they'll be paying less tax than they would if they lived south of the border. Fact. Alexander I, Stewart. I, I, but, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is quite wrong. You know, the fact is that you are, taking, you are taking more out of people's pay packets, and that's what they know, and that's what we know as well. As I said, uh, it's it is quite... The Conservatives are challenging, but also uh, it's the organisations uh, that we represent, the country's business, are also saying that this is wrong. The CBI in Scotland have warned that the tax rise on the budget will make harder for it to attract talent. The Chamber of Commerce has indicated that outside investors will perceive an increase on the cost of doing business here in Scotland. The Retail Consortium have said that tax increases will likely result in lower consumer spending. These are some stark warnings from those in business who understand and know the priorities that we face. Other parties in this chamber would be wise to give them careful consideration. The block grant to the Scottish Government from Westminster will be protected in real terms this financial year and will increase the following year. Even without the SNP's tax rise, the entire Scottish Government budget has therefore been protected, so any decisions they are making are of their own making. The real terms reduction in central government funding for local authorities is a prime example of the decisions taken by the Scottish Government which they have chosen to make. To govern is to choose, but those nationalists choose badly, and they govern badly. Deputy Presiding Officer, some of the recent proposals put forward by the Scottish Labour Party are even worse. Not only are they, as the leader indicated, that he's happy to hit every single taxpayer in Scotland, he's also proposing the support of a 50 pence rate of income tax. 
Even the SNP have dropped that ridiculous policy following the Scottish Government's analysis that it would come actually result in reduction to tax revenues of around £24 million. This is a classic example of ideological policy making that is very likely to undermine the stated objectives and funding our we go forward. At the same time as proposing policies that are lose money and waste money, the, 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 the Labour Party are also wanting to spend even more finances. The leader has said he wants to back uh, all existing uh, and, pay, and pay, pay back all existing PFI contracts. This would cost £29 billion. And he also wants to immediately, if he gets an opportunity, renationalise Scotrail. So Labour can take no opportunities here uh, in telling us what they want to do, because in reality, they're not going to protect anybody. They're just going to attack everybody they can. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, and on the same theme as being honest with the electorate, decisions about taxation must be made on the basis of economics rather than ideology. Our priority at the same time should be growing our economy. Growing our economy is the important issue we have here, Deputy Presiding Officer, and our tax base, not making more money away from and taking more money away from hardworking families, from individuals, and threatening our economic stability. I firmly believe that, ladies and gentlemen, and it's important that we discuss the opportunities that we have here today, and that is not taking place uh, within this chamber. And Labour, I'm afraid you have got no opportunities to give us only problems to deliver. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Speeches no more than five minutes. I call Claire Adamson and I'd remind Jenny Mara to press the request to speak button now. Your intervention would put it off. Claire Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I had hoped this afternoon that we might have some constructive debate and some constructive ideas coming forward and that this wasn't just an opportunity for grievance politics. But I've been sorely disappointed. Murdo Fraser had a little tease at members from a different party about a recent opinion poll. I think the Labour Party would do well to consider that it was the Scottish electorate that dumped them on the sideline of politics. And if they want to get back on the pitch, they severely have to improve their game because the day has given us nothing, no new ideas. Are they seriously going to be voting against increasing health by over £400 million? Are they going to vote, be against £120 million above core education funding, direct to head teachers, to help ensure all young people can fulfil their potential? The Scottish Attainment Channels Challenge is providing £750 million during the course of this Parliament to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. It prioritises improvement in literacy, numeracy, health and well-being and children adversely affected by poverty in Scotland. Now, I understand Mr Gray's concerns about education and I understand a lot of what he said today. However, he did mention the EIS. In a tweet on the day of the budget, they welcomed the increase in the attainment fund, saying it would provide desperate funding for, for schools, mitigating it against the impact of poverty in education. And Lanny Flanagan of the EIS welcomed the fact that the Finance Secretary had confirmed that the damaging 1% public sector pay cap would be lifted in 2018. It says, for far too long, teachers and other public sector workers have been financially punished for an economic situation that was not of their making. The lifting of the pay cap is a long overdue recognition that public sector workers deserve to be paid fairly for the vital work that they do. That was the EIS response. And we have lifted the pay cap for NHS staff, police, teachers and others. And yet, Labour will criticise, no thank you, Labour will criticise when they fail to do the same for they are in power in Wales. In 2018-19, councils received funding through local government finance settlement of more than £10.5 billion. They have also been given the flexibility to raise an additional 77 million by increasing the council tax by up to 3%. I will talk about Scotland. In fact, I'll talk about North Lanarkshire, where I live, where Labour failed to use that 3% uh, council tax increase last year, denying 3.98 million pounds of additional funding to North Lanarkshire. That is a compounded miss. That's not something you can get back in years to come. It's something that will be missed 
for now and forever forward and compounded if they continue not to use that flexibility. And their argument, it's not enough, so we'll not take it. It's absolutely ridiculous attitude to take. At the same time, and it was mentioned about Clyde Manning, North Lanarkshire have already cut classroom assistance. 198 posts last year removed by North Lanarkshire Labour Administration. And we have to consider that we are facing that toxic legacy of PFI. Labour will cart from the sidelines, but it is increasingly clear that we're still paying for the mess of Labour's left left over a decade ago. 426.8 million across our council areas and North Lanarkshire itself facing a PFI bill of 22.5 million and yet they turn down the possibility of additional funding. Voting against this Scottish budget will be a vote Members against in investing in child care, our schools, our hospitals and vital public services giving them the funds they need to deliver better services for Scotland. And I, like all my colleagues here, look forward to the positive proposals coming forward that would allow Labour to deliver some of the demands that they have come to this chamber with today. Because we need ideas in here, we just don't need grievance politics. Thank you. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by John Mason. Ms Mara, please. Presiding officer, uh, Dundee City Council has had to make cuts of 12.5 million <coughs> last year and 23 million the year before. This year, the proposed settlement is so bad that the SNP leader of the council, John Alexander, has written to the cabinet secretary to try to secure a better deal for our city. This comes shortly after announcing that based on the draft budget, Dundee will be facing cuts of up to 15.7 million this year. And extremely worrying, Cabinet Secretary, are indicators from the Council that workers' terms and conditions could be affected and continual references by the Council and Chief Executive to flexibility from staff. Coupled with different shift patterns for care workers, it is very clear to me and to the Scottish Labour Party who will bear the brunt of this latest round of cuts. In Angus too, they have had millions cut from their budget, now have 500 fewer staff than they did in 2010, and there are no signs of this letting up. They plan to shed another 800 jobs over the coming three years. Even the independent leader of the council said that he can't deliver the current range and volume of services and that they will have to prioritise. Now, the cabinet secretary has tried to divert our attention by declaring that councils can raise their tax by up to 3%. But this ignores the fact that the current crisis in local government finance has been crippled by his government's decade-long freeze of the council tax. And it ignores that even a full 3% rise will barely scratch the surface of the cuts required as a result of his budget. In Dundee, in Dundee the SNP council estimates that the full 3% rise will raise 1.5 million in additional revenue, and that is not even one-tenth of the savings that are required. Not even one-tenth, Cabinet Secretary. The problems in NHS Tayside are well known. It is the clearest example in Scotland of mismanagement leading to financial crisis in our public services. The board owes the Scottish Government £35 million and is facing cuts of more than £200 million in the next few years. And that is coupled with the local council services cuts that I have just outlined. Amongst all of this, no, I won't give way, um, the board still struggle to move away from agency nursing and rising prescription costs. But what do we get? A meagre 1.3% rise in real terms for spending for the NHS. Not even close to enough to meet the ever-increasing demands of an ageing population and ill health. And not enough to get NHS Tayside anywhere near financial health. Let me make this one point, Cabinet Secretary, because what of his promised pay rise for public sector workers? He announced in this chamber, with great fanfare, that he himself would give public sector workers a long-awaited pay rise, with those on £30,000 or less getting a 3% rise. On Monday, though, he admitted, under questioning from the Finance Committee, that he hasn't allocated any extra money to councils to pay for that promise. Yeah. So, Finance Secretary, I'm happy to take your intervention. How does 
Dundee City Council pay its workers the pay rise you promised while making cuts of £15.7 million. If you can give council workers in Dundee that answer today, that would be very welcome. Uh, before, uh, Cabinet uh, Secretary, before you respond, the only person you in the chamber is myself as the chair. So please don't use that term with other members. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Jenny Mara for allowing me to, to make this intervention and just to ask the question at the point of time I wanted to make the intervention. Uh, Jenny Mara was speaking about expenditure items. It was my understanding, it was my understanding that the Labour Party was proposing to give all additional revenues that they may raise through taxation to local governments. So why not a penny more for the National Health Service? Jenny Mara. Cabinet, first of all, presiding officer, can I apologise? I'm still getting back to, into my stride after a short absence and I, I heed what you're saying. The Cabinet Secretary forgets that it is he who has the budget in front of him. It is he who is responsible for these decisions and these are his cuts that he is asking people in my city to make and people right across this country. It's surely presiding officer, impossible for this parliament to have confidence in a budget and a finance secretary who refuses to seriously address these issues. So I asked the Scottish Government today, what do they say to those workers in Dundee City Council who don't know yet if they will get the pay rise that he promised them and they so desperately need? And what does he say to the patients, nurses and doctors in NHS Tayside whose health board is in financial dire straits and management seem cannot to, to not be able to get them out of this situation? In Dundee and Angus, like the rest of the country, we are facing increasing demand in our public services, but we are governed by ministers who are not prepared to rise to this challenge. Thank you. You must conclude. You must conclude now. Sorry. You oh. must conclude. Thank you. I call John Mason to be followed by Tom Mason. I'll take that as a clap for the, my forthcoming speech. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I have to say I'm more than happy to speak in this debate on public services, especially as clearly the SNP has a very good record in government in its funding of public services. Health expenditure has been prioritised since 2007, but at the same time local government has been funded for the council tax freeze and we have invested in road and rail infrastructure, unlike with previous administrations, major capital projects have tended to be within time and within budget, meaning we have been able to do more with the same amount of money. Of course, we have been through difficult times and we have not been able to spend as much on public services as most of us would have wanted. One question we have to consider today is what Labour mean by protect public services? Do they mean keeping the same service delivered in the same way with the same number of staff for the same amount of money? Now that technically might mean protecting public services, but I would suggest that that is not actually what the public want or what the public need. If we mean that there should be the same input in money or labour terms, that would leave no room for modernisation. A council investing in a modern bin lorry which required fewer workers while using any savings to increase recycling provision. And if we take health, the SNP certainly has protected spending, but as demand increases, inevitably there are challenges. Should we be protecting the A&E services as it has been, even if that means more and more and more money as more and more and more people go to A&E? Or should we be investing more in community health care and so reduce the need for A&E and potentially reduce the need for hospital beds in the longer term? Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Is, uh, I'm grateful to the intervention. Is the member aware that demand is also rising significantly on local government services? Not to take anything away from the point he's making about the NHS, but surely we have a responsibility to fund those services rather than threaten councils with an even deeper cut if they don't accept arbitrary rate capping. John Mason. Well, I've already said that I think uh, local government has been pretty fairly treated over the years, but I'm happy to accept that both local, both local government and national government are in a very difficult position financially. We do not have endless resources and clearly neither does local government. And we all have to find a balance between how we can raise our income uh, and how we can control our expenditure. Now, I do feel that Labour's approach to protecting public services is far too simplistic. Are we looking here at inputs or outputs or outcomes? 
Does Labour want to protect the inputs, for example, accident emergency costs and staff, or does Labour want to protect outputs, uh, like waiting times or the number of patients treated, or does Labour want to protect and hopefully improve outcomes, such as proportion of population living healthily at home? When we sit in committee, Labour MSPs can often be quite sensible. They would agree that we should emphasise preventative spend and that for whoever is in power just now, budgets are tight. But it seems when we come into this chamber, reasonable discussion tends to go out the window and it is all about easy sound bites and unreasonable expectations. I want to see some public services expanded, for example, the number of hours of childcare provision or the level of support for elderly people in their own home. These are forms of preventative spend and hopefully should mean less need for reactive services in schools and hospitals later on. So if we are suggesting we must protect reactive services, I would say no. We should be increasing preventative services and at that right time reducing the reactive ones. Now the motion focuses on the budget, so it is worth thinking a bit about what the budget options are. Broadly speaking, if we are to spend more in one area, then either we spend less elsewhere or we raise taxes. I think we are in danger of repeating ourselves in these debates, but I'm happy to say again that I support a sensible increase in taxes. But we'd urge that we proceed cautiously because we do not know what the behavioural change there might be, especially if richer taxpayers were to leave Scotland. So I am comfortable with raising bands of income tax by one or two pence, but I would be very wary of raising them at five pence or more in one go. Now, the other option is cutting another area of expenditure, but Labour have been reluctant to say if they would do that. So I'm left wondering what other services they might cut. Just to touch on the Conservative amendment, which focuses on growing the economy. But if the benefits of the growth only go to the top 10% or 1%, as we heard at yesterday's Economy Committee has been the case, who would want that kind of growth? Presiding officer, in conclusion, we have before us today a motion which is probably well-meaning, but is not particularly realistic and which does not sit well in the real world of income and expenditure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mason. Uh, Tom Mason to be followed by Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part today in this debate as it, as it concerns many of the issues that affect our constituents across Scotland. It is important we have a public services that are fit for purpose. And in doing so, we must be mindful of how we raise the money to make it so happen. The SNP draft budget proposes to pay for public services with an increase in income tax, and they are regrettably not the only party to support such a principle. It's certainly been interesting to listen to the Scottish Labour recently, if only in the fact that we are able to see what the real priorities lie. Funding an eye-watering programme of nationalisation by hiking taxes for basic ratepayers. Their idea of progressives is, is making the lowest paid in our society pay more. I believe that asking those earning £12,000 a year to pay for an uncosted rail nationalisation or a £29 billion buyback of existing <coughs> PFI contracts, for example, as supported by the leader in September, is not progressive, it's just wrong. Labour increasingly, Labour increasingly the burden on those who need our help uh, and the most is not required. It is senseless and needless. At higher tax brackets, their plans run into yet more difficulty. Even the SNP accepts that the 50p rate would actually lose money, and yet for the Labour Party, it remains a wonderful idea. Ideologically, ahead of common sense, little wonder Labour are in such a mess. Now, for SNP members, this might be quite a complicated subject to speak about. For almost the, almost the entire length of this Parliament so far, they have been told to believe that tax rises were not the answer. Now, of course, they have been instructed to believe the opposite. Principled government, indeed, I guess. The matter may, is made more complicated by the finance secretary last week accepting the Fraser Anders Institute's point that the Scottish government's total block grant, excluding financial transactions, will increase by around 1% in real, real terms. Saying that this blows the economic case for the announced rises out of the water would, I fear, be somewhat of an understatement. So that they ignore the warnings of Reform Scotland, CBI Scotland, the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, the Scottish Retail Consortium, the Federation of Small Business, and also breaking their own manifesto commitment. 
The SNP misled those who voted for them in, into office, but there is still time to change direction, and I hope they will do so. We in the Conservative Party, however, keep our promises. We said that taxes would be no higher than any elsewhere in the United Kingdom, and will justify the trust of those that voted us by sticking to this position. We here are proud of the action taken to alleviate pressure on our country's lowest paid, such as the UK government continually raising personal allowances since 2010. This entire issue essentially boils down to the rationale and method by which government raises, raises money. Taxation is not a tool to reorder society, it is to raise money for public services. The answer is not to increase the burden on those who already contribute. It is to create more jobs and boost wages so that those who are not active in our economy at the moment can participate and can do so at a much higher level. The SNP has failed to increase the tax base for their 11 years in office. Would make it a pr we would make it a priority. Now, as I said previously, this administration has accepted the block grant it is going up in real terms. This makes a proposal to cut local authority budgets even less sensible. It is unacceptable for the SNP to tell local government that the only way for them to break even is to put up council tax. That, of course, on, on a, in addition to the tax rises last year due to the rebranding of, of the council tax system. They once promised to get rid of the council tax, now they recommend a 3% rise. Yet another U-turn. If other parties are serious about the better funding settlement for public services, I encourage them to, with us to ensure that it's provided by an increase in tax base rather than an increase on burden upon those who need our help the most. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Kate Forbes. We follow by Anna Sarwar. Ms <coughs> Forbes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start by reminding the, Parliament, the uh, Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. So, of course, as some speakers have already said, this debate falls right in the middle of the budget process. And I have just noticed a tweet which suggests that this debate could be better uh, engaged with MSPs going outside and having a big snowball fight. Um, uh, but this... this <laughs> um, that's, that's Is her. that a point of order to suspend proceedings? <laughs> well, it's... It's, cur it's courtesy of, uh, should pay credit where it's due, Philip Sim of, of the BBC. So anyway, the point I was going to make was that, as some speakers have already said, this debate falls right in the middle of the budget process. And it's a budget process which, as uh, members across the chamber know, each of them could help shape and contribute to at a time of minority government. And the real test for all of us including the Labour Party, is the extent to which we want to see change by just verbalising it in this chamber or see change by actively engaging with the Scottish Government to try and shape the budget. And I want to, I do pay tribute to a lot of the speeches that have been made today already because you can see, you can hear the real concern that many members have for the impact that the budget will have on their constituents. This budget will make a difference to every resident in Scotland, from the youngest to the oldest. But last year, if memory serves, Labour's sole contribution to shaping the budget was a whole lot of noise in a debate very similar to this. And it doesn't look like this year is going to be any different. There is a budget process. Yes. Jamie Green. Thank you, Boris Singh. I mentioned uh, the member says that this budget will uh, have a noticeable effect on people across Scotland. Does she accept that there are genuine cuts to services which councils across the country are proposing right now that they will have to make if the budget goes through? Kate Forbes. I do recognise that this budget will ensure that £500 million worth of tax cuts will not be passed on to those that we are talking about in terms of deeper cuts. As John Mason has said earlier, we are all operating within financial constraints in terms of the Scottish Government's budget and in terms of budget decisions that are made. But what I do see in this budget is a budget that will increase spending on health by over £400 million. I see a budget that will lift the 1% public sector pay cap and provide for a 3% pay rise for NHS staff. 
for police, for teachers, for those earning up to £30,000, which incidentally, as has been referenced already, the Labour Party have not done where they are in power elsewhere. And I didn't mention the name of that country. Labour talks about education. In fact, we're all talking about education. But there are people in here that will not back a budget that will provide an extra £120 million over and above core education funding direct to head teachers. A budget that will invest nearly £2.4 billion in our colleges, universities, enterprise and skills bodies, including a real terms increase for both college and higher education budgets. We talk about local government spending, but there are people in here that will not back a budget that will protect local government spending in terms of day-to-day -day spending for local services in cash terms and deliver an increase in capital spending of almost £90 million that will contribute £756 million towards the whopping £3 billion of investment to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, which are desperately needed in my constituency in rural and remote places like Sky, where lack of affordable housing is having a knock-on impact on being able to recruit staff. It's a budget that talks about rural communities, an issue that's very close to my heart, because it's a budget that will support the procurement of £600 million towards the R100 programme to deliver superfast broadband to 100% of business and residential premises across Scotland. So back to Mr Green's intervention, the reason I back this budget is because it's a budget that will have a positive impact on every resident in Scotland. It's a budget that doesn't pass on tax cuts and it's a budget that ensures a secure source of funding for our public services across Scotland. And if any party in this chamber wants to include something in that budget, then the Cabinet Secretary is ready and waiting to listen to your suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Donald Cameron. Mr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the budget, the Scottish Government had a choice. It could have chosen to stop the cuts and protect public services, or it could have chosen to endorse austerity and inflict yet more cuts on Scotland's vital public services. Sadly, it comes as little surprise that they chose the latter. More cuts to council budgets, more cuts to Scotland's classrooms, more cuts to Scotland's NHS services, and no real plan to invest in and protect our public services. If only Scotland had a government that was prepared to stand up to Tory austerity, if only we had a Scottish government and a finance secretary who was prepared to be bold with the powers that he had at his disposal, but no. I'll take a quick intervention from the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. And if only the Labour Party had a leader that would present tax plans in advance of the budget being considered by the Scottish Parliament. Could Anna Sarwar advise me what the, the, the shape of Labour's tax plan might look like so it can help inform this debate? Anna Sarwar. Well, well, the Cabinet Secretary knows that I actually did publish detailed tax plans yeah. uh, and sent them to the Cabinet Secretary, to which he didn't respond. And he's already seen largely about what we want our tax plans to be. That's to stop cuts because we have up to £700 million Absolutely. of a black hole Absolutely. to council budgets. And what does that mean? It means cuts to social care packages across the country. It means cuts to individual joint boards who commission care packages for vulnerable Scots. And he talks about the £400 million for the NHS. But FOIs that I did to health boards right across the country have shown that they are planning to make £1.5 billion in cuts over the next four years. 1.5 billion pounds of cuts to the NHS. And as a result, public services in Scotland face a deepening crisis despite the best efforts of staff. Now we've heard about the pay cap. We should remind the SNP benches that they actually voted against breaking the pay cap in April last year. But I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, he's talked about ending the pay cap, but can he guarantee a fully funded real terms pay increase to NHS staff and other public sector staff too. Because if he can't provide a fully funded pay increase, what does that mean as a result? It means either more cuts to services or it means further job losses. That is not acceptable across the country and it's certainly not acceptable in our health service. Because we have a health service that is in crisis. Yet not one utterance from a health secretary who every week it appears breaks the record for the worst performing Scottish Health Secretary ever. Last week, the worst ever accident and emergency performance figures. This week, even worse. One in four Scots 
now waiting longer in a and &E than the Scottish Government say they should. 40,000 bed days lost in the Scottish NHS last November, despite a promise from the SNP Health Secretary Shona Robinson to eradicate delayed discharge. 500 operations cancelled in the first week of January alone, almost the same number as the whole of January last year. Seven out of eight of the Scottish Government's own key performance indicators not met. Patient care being put at risk because of a lack of resource. And yet it's never ever the fault of the Cabinet Secretary or the SNP or indeed the responsibility of the Scottish Government. It's always somebody else's fault. A record-breaking Cabinet Secretary who herself sounds like a broken record. Yes, Presiding Officer, it doesn't have to be like this. Derek Mackay has the powers at his fingertips to stop the cuts. He could bring forward budget plans that would stop the cuts, but only if he wanted to. He could use the powers of the parliament that he campaigned for to actually invest in public services, but only if he really wanted to. What we have is a Derek Mackay budget, which in the face of Tory austerity, raises a mere 28 million pound extra for public services. It's actually just a Tory light budget. Presiding officer, SNP backbenchers have the chance to join with Labour today and say no to austerity. I stood shoulder to shoulder with every single Glasgow SNP, MP and MSP in the face of job centre closures. Why won't they stand shoulder to shoulder with us on police station closures? Why aren't they standing shoulder to shoulder with us to the cuts to the RDH? or the cuts to the Vale of Leaving, or the cuts to the Inverclyde Royal Hospital. Because it's easy to protest about cuts made by Westminster and stay silent when there's cuts made by your own government here in Scotland. Cuts to Scotland, made in Scotland, for Scotland, by the Scottish National Party and the SNP. I think Scotland deserves much better than this. Thank you. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Kenneth Gibson, and Kenneth Gibson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking those, pe those workers in our public services for the job they are doing, particularly today, in keeping our country moving uh, with extreme winter weather affecting people across Scotland. But offering thanks is, is never enough, because public sector workers need to see genuine commitment to the services they work in. Uh, in terms of Labour, that once great institution, um, Labour have called, called this debate today. And, and while, I, while I agree that we uh, all need to hold, we all need to hold this government to account. Excuse me a minute, I'm sure you want to hear the rest of the compliment. <laughs> while I agree we all need to hold this government to account. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Just out of curiosity, uh, are the Tory party proposing to vote with the Labour Party on the motion this evening? Because I think that would be quite telling. Donald Cameron. We'll have to wait and see. Um, it's equally uh, appropriate to point out, presiding officer, that Labour's plans to hike taxes would damage our economy and in turn damage our public services. But in relation to the SNP, I fear that this debate, like many others, has seen a very familiar pattern emerge. We've seen the SNP boasting about their record in delivering public services in Scotland. But they essentially peddle a false economy. They regularly say that the only way you can promise to increase spending is by taxing people more. Yet anyone with an ounce of sense will know that you can only have strong public services if you have a strong economy. A strong economy means supporting businesses so that they can grow and employ more people and thus widen the tax base, not hiking up the taxes of existing taxpayers. A strong economy means a competitive tax regime on a par with the rest of the UK so that people have more say over how they spend their money, not creating a slew of new tax bans which will see 1.16 million Scots facing a tax rise. I'm sorry, I don't have time. That is our message and we will continue to stand by it. Now we've focused on investment in the NHS and in schools and in transport, but we should not forget one area that has taken a battering, namely local government. Local councils have been hit time after time and they are all too often the scapegoat for this SNP government. These cuts lie at the door of the SNP and no one else. As Murdo Fraser has said, there have been real-term cuts in total central government funding for local authorities from this year to the next 
of £81 million and distributable revenue grant has been cut by more than £200 million. So local councillors across my region, the Highlands and Islands, that I spoke to, some of whom have no party alignment, have real and genuine fears for the future of services like never before. The effects of these cuts are, of course, felt by the very people who put us here. Let me give one example. On Monday, I met with constituents on Isla. Now, Isla is an island which is a thriving tourist industry, driven in part by its large number of whisky distilleries. And in many ways, it's a microcosm of Scotland. It already contributes a huge amount in tax receipts from the whisky sector alone and has huge economic potential. But what issue did every person I met talk about but decaying infrastructure, the state of the crumbling roads that they are unable to repair? I would... I, I, very briefly. Cabinet Secretary. Would Donald Cameron then like to quantify the extra resource that should go to local government and where that should come from? Donald Cameron. Well, the fact is, the uh, Cabinet Secretary has a choice. His budget is protected. The block grant is up in real terms. He doesn't need to make these cuts, especially when that budget is protected. It is his choice. And these cuts are particularly pertinent when thousands of tourists visit places like Isla and the havoc that they wreak, not only on the local industry, but on the locals who live there. They're just a few examples of the reality on the ground for people living in my region. That's the reality of the SNP's mismanagement of the economy. That's the reality of the SNP's cuts to local authority funding and the knock-on effect on public services and the people who deliver them. Because under this SNP government, Deputy Presiding Officer, people will pay more in tax but are getting less in services. And ultimately, this comes down to a political choice for the SNP. The SNP have chosen to make these cuts and as they sow the wind, they will reap the whirlwind. They have the benefit of a real terms increase of the block grant from the UK government. They have more powers than ever before, thanks to the UK government's commitment to empowering this parliament. They can deliver strong public services, fit for the present and the future, but they will only do that if they focus on the issues that the people of Scotland actually care about. Thank you, I call Kenneth Gibson. Then we move to closing speeches. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's extraordinarily telling that the Labour Party has presented a motion to the Chamber today which is as brief as their contribution to constructively discussing this year's budget. They made absolutely no effort to do so. Yes. Labour has had countless opportunities to bring valuable recommendations and suggestions to the table, but instead we've had weeks of empty rhetoric. It's all too easy to moan about the draft budget, but clearly far more difficult to outline what Labour would offer in its place, both in terms of taxation and spending. Although we had today Mr Kelly telling us that he's taking, and I quote, adequate time over his tax proposals. I'm sure all waiting with bated breath for those. In stark contrast to the vacuum of policies from Labour, the Finance Secretary has constructed a balanced budget in the face of a real terms cut to this Parliament's resource budget of over £200 million, thanks to the Tories at Westminster. Figures, Labour MSQs and MSPs and indeed Tories uh, such as Donald Cameron um, quote, bear no relation to reality today. At last week's Local Government and Communities com Committee, we unanimously agreed that the real terms reduction to local government resource grant as informed by SPICE would be £58.1 million pounds, or 0.6% and that's before council tax increases are added or negotiations on the budget concluded. Capital, meanwhile, will go up in real terms by 77.1 million or 9.8% in real terms. Now, some 20 years ago this week, I, as a Glasgow city councillor, the only one for the SNP in Glasgow in those days, we've got 39 now, stood megaphone in hand to address a crowd of angry council workers in George Square. The reason? The decision of the UK Labour government to cut £500 million, figures are here from SPICE, in real terms, some 6% of Scottish local government funding at a time of no recession. A third of that cut fell on Glasgow, which suffered a real terms cut of 7% in a single year, leading to the sacking of 3,000 Glasgow council workers in a single year. There wasn't a ban on compulsory redundancies, as under this enlightened SNP administration. No Labour just told folk to go. There was such unrest that the council almost didn't deliver its budget with Labour councils ignominiously being sneaked into and out of the building. 
Now, this party, the architects of austerity, come here to criticise a policy their own party has so much greater experience of. In 2007, when the SNP uh, came to power, Wendy Alexander gave the famous 100 Caterpillar speech in which she denounced the Scottish Government for not having 3% year-on-year real-terms cuts to local government budgets, top sliced. Labour MSPs were so disgusted by Wendy, they unanimously voted her in as their leader uh, a few weeks later. In 2015, Labour MPs, including Anna Sarwar, the man who suddenly decides he's opposed to austerity, walked into the lobbies at Westminster and voted for £30 billion of cuts across the UK, including £3,000 million to this parliament. So don't come here with your hypocrisy. And no, I tried to intervene in you twice. You wouldn't take an intervention. I mean, Minister Sarwar, you need to understand how the rules work in this parliament. Taxation, what a bunch of hypocrites. Point of, point of order. Thank, thank you, President Officer, for the point of order. On, on a point of factual correct, uh, correctness... That's not a point of order. Uh, Sit uh, down, please. It's not a point of order. Sit I down, please. Tried to intervene twice. He ignored me. Mr Gibson. And taxation, Labour squeal because the SNP want to have a top rate of tax of 46 pence in the pound for 13 consecutive years by the last four weeks of the 1970-2010 UK Labour government. They had a top tax rate of 40 pence in the pound, but criticise us for going up to 48 pence. Now, the reality is that the Labour Party is the party of austerity, tuition fees, Trident, PFI, the House of Lords and the Iraq War. And importantly, a party without any ideas. Uh, Mark Drakeford of the, of the pa Labour Party in Wales has said that the reason they have to make cuts, the reason they have to make cuts, yeah, you applaud, but we know it's sarcastic because you're embarrassed at what, what you're doing in power down there. You're actually embarrassed. He has said that you're having to make uh, cuts to local government because of the UK government uh, um, uh, settlement on Wales. And if you actually watch the leader, Jeremy Corbyn, which I'm sure a few of you do, every week he denounces the UK government for its settlement in Wales. Every single week. When, when Prime Minister uh, May responds to any question, it's all... Well, the reason why the NHS is the worst in Wales is because of UK government cuts. So if you want to attack us for what we're doing here, you have to take responsibility from power. The Labour Party is a party without ideas, a party that can count, and a party that's got please nothing conclude. to offer the people of Scotland, which is why you went I from 53 constituency conclude. MSPs to three under devolution. Please conclude. Thank you. Uh, can I... Can I also remind members not to use the term you? I was kind enough not to intervene in your speech, but I've said it already. Do not use that term in here unless addressing the chair. We now move to closing speeches. I, I hope this is a little more sedate. Perhaps not. I call on Willie Rennie. <laughs> Six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. God, what a billing I can get for this speech. I had thought I couldn't get any worse, but then Kenny Gibson got to his feet. This debate hasn't been particularly edifying, but let me focus on a positive. I thought Kate Forbes's contribution to this debate was very good. I thought the calm, rational advocacy of what she believed were the budget benefits is the way that perhaps other backbenchers on the SNP benches could follow. She put her points forward. I didn't necessarily agree with a lot of them but she was respectful to the other parties in the way that she put forward her case. I thought it was a decent attempt to actually try and have a, a decent debate. I looked for other positive contributions in the chamber, but let me move on, um, because there were not many. Um, but Kate Forbes, I think, did make a, a good contribution. My officers and staff come into contact with people in times of crisis day in, day out, and it caters for a huge amount of our demand. That's Paul Anderson from the police in Dundee. He's talking about mental health services and the considerable pressure that it's putting on the resources of the police. And that's why I think this budget, therefore, needs to try and address, I believe, one of the biggest pressures that our NHS faces, but also public services in the broader context face as well, and that is mental health services. Now, it's a great disappointment to me that despite many, many warm words and high rhetoric on mental health, 
we still lag way behind on the provision of actual mental health services. The figures published last year showed that about 3,000 people were waiting for mental health treatment, way beyond what they should have been waiting. And we've also seen that CAM services, services for young people and adolescents, are falling way behind as well. And that's why I was particularly pleased to hear the report from Sam H this morning about training teachers in mental health first aid. Some of the things that we should be doing to try and give the support to children at the very early stages, before the problems become more substantial in later life. That kind of early intervention is what re is required. And that's why we've advocated a substantial increase in funding for mental health services. We believe that the spend, which we believe is around about a billion pounds just now on mental health, should increase to 1.2 billion pounds. I think it's a reasonable, actually quite a modest increase in investment which we believe should be forthcoming to deal with something that's having an impact on a variety of services across the public sector. But we also think this budget should address another major problem. And we've heard just today about the, the latest GDP figures for Scotland, which show it's 0.2%, 0.2, 0.2%. It's bumping along the bottom in terms of growth. We need a big change. Tom Arthur was right to talk about the massive challenges that the country faces. He talked about Brexit. And that's why it's quite disappointing that for a number of years, including this year, the government has been so timid with its response. I think there should be a transformational investment in education. I've talked already about investing in nursery education, the best investment that you can make at the very, very early years, something we advocated for years, and eventually the government came on board, particularly for two-year-olds. But we should also be investing in a pupil premium. Again, the government's five years behind where England was at, where they've managed to close the attainment gap by five percentage points. Big investment to make a transformational change, investing in children to give them the skills for the future of the economy. And then finally, to invest in colleges as well, which have, I think, borne the brunt of much of the government's uh, cuts in expenditure, and I think unfairly so. And that's why I think this budget should address that too. So two big areas, mental health and education, to have that transformational effect, but not just for education's own purpose, to, but to invest in the economy, to deal with a massive challenge that we've got coming down the road with Brexit. I was intrigued by Alexander Stewart's question. I think his contribution. I think he's right to talk about the balance between tax and spend, but it's not all just one way. Public expenditure can be a force for good by investing in mental health and education to boost the economy, which helps us all. I think to just portray it as somehow cutting tax is the only way to boost the economy, I think is wrong. And if I can gently remind him that it is his government in the United Kingdom that is proposing a social care tax in local government and a police tax in local government in England. So there are stealth taxes, you might describe them as, that have been implemented by the Conservatives. I'm actually reading a book just now by Ken Clark. It's his autobiography called Turning Blue. And he takes great pride in saying how he managed to get a hold of the stealthy taxes through the Parliament without anybody noticing. He's bragging about it now. I would just gently remind the Conservatives about that time in government that they are in favour of tax, but perhaps not being upfront about it. <laughs> Finally, I want to actually show a chink of light I, was, I thought perhaps was forthcoming from the Finance Secretary about a report that we don't quite know get yet, about yet that's been produced by a committee that I can't report on, but is indicating that perhaps there might be support for the ferries for the Northern Isles. And I would urge the Finance Secretary to follow through on that, to make sure the finance is forthcoming for these vital services in the North. Because if they are not, we will see cuts to ferries or cuts to public services. And that is my final message to the Finance Secretary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. I now call Patrick Harvey to close for the Green Six Minutes. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, um, I think I began my opening speech by saying that additional time in the Chamber to debate the budget before we get into the, the formal process uh, of voting and committee scrutiny is worthwhile if we use it properly. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that we have used this opportunity as constructively as we could have done. I say that collectively. Uh, I think your, uh, your suggestion that we should all try to be more sedate than Kenny Gibson 
presiding officer, might have been uh, uh, ir irrelevant. I'm not sure any of us would be capable of being less sedate than Kenny Gibson uh, during this, this debate. But I would like to urge all political parties in closing today and in the continuing scrutiny over the next two weeks to try every time to be constructive, to put forward solutions rather than only problems. I'm very focused on doing that, on making sure that we can reverse the cuts to local services, not just rant about them, not just complain about them. I share the anger of many people who've spoken today about the cuts to local services, but I want to see that budget line changed rather than just uh, angry speeches from those of us who are concerned. Uh, I, I also want to make the case that local government needs its own autonomy to be respected. Parliament has missed, and government has missed, many opportunities over the years to reform local taxation and rate capping. The current approach that the Scottish Government has of rate capping, especially with the threats of even deeper cuts to councils that don't accept this arbitrary, unlegislated rate cap uh, on council tax, is not a principled approach. Derek Mackay also told the Finance Committee earlier this week he wanted to emphasise the fact that local government keeps non-domestic rate revenue. But he is deciding, he is deciding centrally to offer a big package of non-domestic rates cuts. A, a package, in fact, which amounts to more than half of the additional revenue he intends to raise from his income tax policies. I'm also going to be focused over the next two weeks and continuing to make the case for low carbon infrastructure investment. Right around the country, in probably every member's constituency or region, there are opportunities to invest in better public transport and to give councils and local communities the opportunity to put the ideas uh, onto the agenda for public transport, whether that's opening uh, new or reopened railway stations, whether it's investing in better buses, uh, and we've put forward ideas to the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that that can be made a reality. And on public sector pay, uh, I'll take one brief intervention. Jamie Green. He's really Mr. giving Green. some thought as to his, uh, uh, the budget process of the next few weeks, but does he really think that hard-working families across Scotland can afford an inflation-busting rise in their council tax whilst seeing income tax increases at the same time. Does he really believe that? Patrick Harvey. Uh, we can, uh, the, I, I believe that council tax should be decided by local government. I think that's a point of principle. Uh, and as for what people can afford, we need a tax system including property taxes, reformed, modernised property taxes and progressive income tax so that those who can afford to pay more do so and I count himself and myself uh, in that. Uh, we can do that while protecting low and middle earners. On public sector pay, I want to reinforce the, the comments made by Ian Gray, uh, particularly in relation to the teaching profession. If we're concerned about the problems of teacher recruitment and retention and our wider public services as well, a below inflation pay settlement, I think, deserves to be challenged. And I would agree with Kate Forbes uh, on that. Not uh, sadly what she said in the chamber today, but what she said on national television very recently, that the pay settlement ought to be above inflation. There is a case, there is a case for restoration in the lost value of public sector pay, uh, and we also need to recognise the further impact that that will have on local government. And I think the, the Cabinet Secretary has not yet made the case for what he proposed a few weeks ago. Uh, in relation to the tax debate, presiding officer, I, I think the Greens have made a serious contribution to shifting the debate on income tax away from just do we increase the basic rate or not? Do we have to raise revenue from those on below average incomes? We are the party that was first to show that you don't have to do that. We can raise revenue progressively with a larger number of rates and bans in a way that makes sure that we protect people on low and average incomes. I'm still committed to seeing that happen. I'm pleased that the government have moved in that direction, but I challenge the scale of what they're proposing, as well as what they're describing as an anomaly uh, on the basic rate. It's not an anomaly. It's clearly the only effect of that higher rate threshold. The only effect of it is to give a tax cut to those high earners, and there's no justification for that. So we'll continue to make the case for a more uh, 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 assertive and more ambitious approach on taxation. 
uh, a, a sadly presiding officer in closing, I have to say that I think both Labour and the Conservatives seem not to be grasping the new process. Tax proposals need to be put forward early enough that they can go through government scrutiny, parliamentary scrutiny and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And for the Conservatives, who still seem to be the only party believing in the magic money tree, future growth, even if they think that will in future raise more taxation, it will reduce tax revenues in the coming year if they cut the tax rates, and they have a responsibility to show where that would come from. And so if they end up supporting the unamended motion, if that's what we end up voting on, I'm afraid that will leave this debate looking like something of a farce for a motion talking about public services to be supported by the party that wants to cut them by half a billion. Thank you. I call Jamie Green, close to the Conservative six minutes. Mr Green, please. Uh, Labour's short motion today says that the draft budget does not protect public services, and that is a fact. But James Kelly opened the debate today with some insight, and whilst quite sparse in detail, into how Labour will address that very issue, namely demanding tax rises. Now, I have, thankfully, quite a distant memory of Labour in government. Uh, mostly from my teenage years dancing along to D. Ream. I thought that things can only get better was a futuristic reference to the 2010 general election when the UK would have to pick itself up from 13 years of Labour in government. Let us never forget that by the time Labour left government in 2010, manufacturing in the UK had declined by 9%. Britain had the longest recession in the G20 with six consecutive quarters of negative growth and the UK had the largest deficit of any major economy. Youth unemployment was at a record high. One in five were out of work. I was perhaps one of the lucky ones. And let us never forget that when it comes to tax, we all know Labour's track record on this. In their 13 years of government, they doubled the tax rate for the poorest in this country. They scrapped the 10p tax rate, and they doubled it instead to 20. So it comes as no surprise to anyone that when Labour say they want to increase your taxes, you can be forgiven for suspicion over their ability to spend it wisely. Scottish Labour's current uncosted spending plans would undoubtedly see further tax rises across all rates, including those on the lowest incomes. Their plans to renationalise everything that moves, including our railways, would shift millions of pounds, would shift millions of pounds of liability and cost onto the shoulders of the Scottish taxpayer. Labour would kickstart their term in government by spending nearly the entire Scottish budget just on buying back PFI contracts alone. And that's on top of the billions of pounds required for their very lengthening list of freebies and giveaways. New leader, same old Labour. But it would be remiss of me, presiding officer, to use my six minutes just to point out misgivings in Labour's financial credibility and let Mr Mackay off scot-free, especially off the back of today's figures, the Scottish Government's own figures, which show that the Scottish economy continues to lag behind that of the rest of the UK. Instead of fighting for the top spot in the UK economy, we're fighting to avoid recession. Since I was elected to this place, we've averaged just 0.1% growth. GDP remains flat in real terms in Scotland. And year on year, the Scottish economy has grown at a third the rate of the rest of the UK. Today's findings must make for some very grave and uncomfortable reading for the SNP government. Last year, Derek, honey, I shrunk the economy, Mackay, had to endure the embarrassment of financially overseeing the only part of the UK with a shrinking economy. But let us give the financial secretary credit where it is due. Because in the face of criticism from the CBI and the FSB and the Scottish Chambers of Commerce and basically anyone with a grasp of economics, he stands up and says, enough of your facts and figures. We're doing things my way. At least you know where you are with Derek Mackay. The sad reality is that if the Scottish economy grows at the rate it is currently grown at, we will be, we will be nearly £17 billion worse off by 2022 than if we had matched the growth rates across the rest of the UK. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why? 
Cabinet Secretary. The budget process requires the Scottish Fiscal Commission to set out their forecasts following policy analysis. What do the Tories propose to do to ensure that there's more resources for public services, which seems to be what they're arguing for today? How far do we go in the £501 million tax cut the Tories would like to see us deliver? Jamie Green. Uh, the SNP talk about tax cuts for the rich. It is the SNP that thinks that anyone over, earning over 33 grand in Scotland is somehow rich and should see their taxes go up. We disagree with that immensely. This is what you can do. You can stop wasting money. You can grow the tax base and you can grow the economy. That's what we think you should do. If the Finance Secretary, if the finance secretary wants to find more cash, there it is right there. We're not asking for anything magical or mystical. We're asking you to grow the Scottish economy at the same rate as the rest of the UK. 11 years of sluggish growth, and it is local authorities who are now paying the price for it. In Inverclyde and North Ayrshire councils, they are actively consulting on which public services to cut, reducing grants to volunteer organisations, reducing employability contracts, increasing burial charges and parking charges, removing breakfast clubs, closing public toilets, libraries and youth centres. This draft budget will see councils up and down Scotland making cuts like this. Yes, they can increase council tax, but even as is in the case of Inverclyde, this would raise no more than three million pounds. It does not even scratch the surface of the cuts they are having to make. Responsibility for failing to grow the Scottish economy lies fairly and squarely at the door of this government. Nicola Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon and Derek Mackay simply cannot tax their way out of the funding black hole that they have created. And nor should Scottish taxpayers be expected to be like their failure to grow the Scottish economy this past decade. I'm afraid, presiding officer, it's squeaky bum time for the middle, middle benches right now. And I urge members across this chamber to support our amendment this afternoon. Thank you. Not happy about that. Not happy. I'm sure you can do better. I uh, call on Derek Mackay to close for the government. Minute, uh, Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, I'm sure we're all left with an image that we would soon uh, wish to move on from. I, I think actually Kate Forbes uh, made a helpful point, um, and, it, and it reflects some of the contributions from some members in the chamber today around what has been seen to be a bun fight in the chamber. That is a very sad reflection on the quality of debate. And I'm not saying that in a partisan way, but a very sad reflection on the quality of debate on, frankly, for me as Finance Secretary, the most important matter, uh, the budget. It is fair to ask questions of government, of course, but opposition members equally can abdicate their responsibility and bring forward a constructive approach so that in a parliament of minorities, we can reach a majority view that reflects the position of Scotland in relation to the budget tax and expenditure. So in that sense, I appreciate Willie Rennie bringing some calm and rational um, levelling uh, of the debate. And equally, I have to say the party that has uh, frankly engaged the most constructively so far has been uh, the Greens. Now, there are, there are, well, you know, even when the Labour Party, even when the Labour Party simply attacks the Greens for daring to even negotiate negotiate their position with the government seemed to be an attack from the Labour Party. And I simply say this, that if the Tories and the Labour Party want to be in the same boat of opportunism and oppositionalism for its own sake, I don't think that's fitting of a parliament whose powers have matured and in response, surely all parliamentarians should engage in a constructive fashion when it comes to issues such as income tax and expenditure and the choices that we make. And one of the substantial choices that this government has made is to invest in the National Health Service. Yes, there are huge demands on the National Health Service. We can see that right now. And that's why there's a proposal to have an above an inflation increase uh, for the National Health Service. But there's many other positives in the budget as well. Not an extra allocation of just £28 million for our public services, but hundreds of millions of pounds more uh, for our public services right across the board. And of course, if you look at the GDP statistic today, we should do more to help grow our economy. One of the reasons we are allocating a, an uplift to the economy brief of some 64% uplift for that particular portfolio. But since we're debating and discussing uh, the budget, I would want to re-emphasize some of the key investment uh, proposals. 
Incidentally, the amount raised from the government's tax policies is £362 million from our tax policy decisions. That's a matter of fact. And some members don't seem to appreciate that it can't be mythical growth that we would like to have had. It must be the SFC forecasts that underpin our budget process. And within that, we're investing more in the NHS, as I say, an above inflation increase, more in total for health and sport, now reaching over £13.6 billion. Uh, listen very closely to Willie Rennie, more for mental health services uh, as, as well, of course. James Kelly. Thank you, Secretary, for taking the, the intervention. In terms of where the money's been allocated, you didn't ask, answer Jenny Mara's point. In terms of the uplift on public sector pay, how do you expect councils to fund that when, in actual fact, their budgets, as Ms Mara outlined in relation to the knee, has been cut by £15.9 million? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government, this seems to be a misunderstanding, doesn't set local government pay. Our public sector pay policy is for those under our control and, yes, becomes a benchmark, for example, the NHS. And I explained very clearly on the 14th of December what our position was in relation to pay. In terms of resources to local government, eh, broadly speaking, we've protected cash and resource, we've increased resource and capital spending, we're doubling the funding for city and region deals, we're taking housing support to over 700 a million pounds. We're expanding early learning and childcare and funding local authorities to do that, protecting culture and sport, responding positively to the Barclay Review and the services that local government delivers. And on social care, we are delivering £66 million pounds more. This is a government which puts its money where its mouth is when it comes to our priorities, protecting the National Health Service. Protecting the National Health Service, investing £4 billion pounds in infrastructure, expanding our economy with a, a huge uplift in that particular uh, brief and investing uh, more in key areas. And I was coming to mental health as well because it's important. There are also new resources for mental health to take us to that level of 800 additional mental health workers over the next five years. Years. In terms of police and fire, more in real terms for those services, more for the attainment gap to tackle that inequality in supporting education directly, more for culture that I've touched upon and supporting the big events in Scotland as well, as well as mitigating the cuts from the UK government. I mean, it was a different Tory party we were hearing from today, one that suggests they want to spend more on our public services, but in fact doesn't want divergence from the rest of the United Kingdom on tax position. The Tory tax policy, in fact, in addition to a £211 million cut for next year in fiscal resource, would expect us to cut public services by £501 million. We as a government are not willing to make that reduction to fund Tory tax cut policies that they appear to be running away from now. Now, it looks as if the Labour Party and the Tory Party are on the same boat this evening to vote uh, together on the Labour Party's motion. It tells you quite a lot about the position of the Labour Party that the Tories can now support that particular position. But there's a range of areas we're investing more for our public services and doing as we said we would do, lift the public sector pay cap of 1%, unprecedented anywhere in the United Kingdom. So this budget, this budget, I'll take the intervention from Jenny, Jenny Mara. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I mean, as a matter of fact, if the Labour Party wants to talk about how you treat the workforce, let's just look at Glasgow today and what Susan Aitken, the leader of Glasgow City Council, has done around equal pay. You see, we've been putting resources into local authorities and we will deliver fairness. I do not set local government pay policy, but I believe that it is a fair settlement from the draft budget. But you see, the Tories want to raise less and spend more, but ultimately for both opposition parties, there will come a choice. As we embark on this process, and I've pledged to have an open door, engaging, uh, listening con to constructive suggestions from any opposition party, I've tried to embark in that fashion in advance of the budget and how I conducted the income tax policy. But there will come a moment, a choice, when Parliament has to choose. 
Stage three of the budget, the Scottish rate resolution, yes, the statutory instrument around non-domestic rates as well. And what the Labour Party is clearly doing, unlike other opposition parties, I've no hope for the Tories, by the way, because of their tax position, but I would have thought that other progressive parties would recognise the hundreds of millions of pounds more we are proposing to put into our public services. And the choice that come will be this. Do progressive parties want to reject a more progressive tax system, reject support for our economy, reject a pay policy that delivers for our frontline workers, and reject a hundred, hundreds of millions of pounds more in our frontline services? Because ultimately that will be the choice, more for our public services or against. And to shape that final budget, to shape it, the opportunity is now. Engage with me constructively. Don't play games with the people of Scotland and I will deliver for those people in a constructive and consensual fashion. Thank you, Colin. Monica Lennon to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this has been a passionate debate, as it should be. We all depend on public services and during this budget process, all of our constituents are depending on us. They're depending on us to make a stand and to protect public services. That is why Scottish Labour has called this debate today and we make no apologies for that. MSPs have a chance to call out this cuts budget and its impact on public services. When the votes are counted at decision time, we will find out whose side they are on. Will they rally round Derek Mackay and his failure of a budget, a budget that only raises an additional £28 million for public services, when COSLA warns, well, that's what the Fraser of Allender Institute says, the Cabinet Secretary, and when COSLA warn that local government services alone need an additional £545 million just to stand still? Or will they vote on principle, vote for Scottish Labour's motion and confront Derek Mackay with the reality of his plan? Because the bottom line is that this draft budget does not protect public services. SNP MSPs looking at their whip sheet in front of them must know this is true. Our constituents know it, workers know it and trade unionists know it. For it is abundantly clear that this budget will not deliver enough resources to sustain the vital public services we rely on to keep us safe, healthy, educated and to build strong and resilient communities where businesses can thrive and our environment safeguarded for future generations. The facts speak for themselves. I'll take the intervention. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to, to Monica Lennon for giving way and I think uh, if I understand the Labour position properly we would like to achieve many of the same things though we have different approaches to trying to do that. But does Monica Lennon really ask us to vote in principle for a motion, the Labour motion that I can support, that she can support, with Tory support, the people who want to take half a billion pounds out of public services? If the Labour motion passes with Conservative support, will that not leave us looking like a bit of a farce? Monica Lennon. If I can remind Patrick Harvey what we've done, James Kelly has exposed the flaws in this budget and the, the tax plans. Well it's, well, it's true. But we know, we do recognise that there needs to be substantial tax changes in this budget. And that's why we've said we'll set that out ahead of the stage one of this bill. Now, I'm not interested in getting Tory support. I'm interested in what we've heard about our public services and how we're going to pay for them. And that is a matter of principle, Patrick Harvey, because the facts do speak for themselves. This budget, as it stands, this budget, as it stands, will cut a further £135 million from local government services this year. Figures confirmed by Spice on top of the 500, let me finish, on top of the £545 million identified by COSLA. This, Cabinet Secretary, is a £700 million gap in local budget services for this year. Chair Mackay. Lennon, give me a clue as to when the people of Scotland, never mind Parliament, will get any sight of Labour's tax plans to fund this so-called £700 million extra investment just for councils, not for the National Health Service. Monica Lennon. And I think James Kelly's already clarified it. But if I can make some progress, presiding officer, how can some members... 
How can some members in this chamber who proclaimed an anti-austerity platform think that somehow this budget is anywhere near an acceptable deal for local services? I don't really think it's, it's funny at all. Local government has already sustained huge and disproportionate cuts, 1.5 billion in total since 2011, inflicting irreparable damage to our communities. But SNP members don't want to hear about that because the SNP have taken Tory austerity and more than doubled it, passing it on to local government. They are no friends of ours. They've taken it on and passed it on to local government. The figures show that the local government revenue budget was cut more than three times faster than the government revenue budget between 2013-14 and 2016-17. But, Presiding Officer, at the heart of our motion today is the underlying reasons for why any of this actually matters, why these cuts matter, and that is the human cost of austerity. Because £135 million from local councils this year and £1.5 in total from the coffers since 2011 are not just meaningless numbers on a page. I don't think it's that funny uh, to uh, Mr Fitzpatrick. We've heard an awful lot about the impact in Dundee and the North East from Jenny Mann an example of a tenacious uh, MSP if ever you saw one. These cuts have an impact. These cuts have an impact on the lives of people across Scotland in our communities every day, all year round, not just in the winter crisis. And as Anna Sarwar has stated, cuts to integrated joint boards and health boards facing cuts totaling more than 1.5 billion. It's by listening to communities. Well, if you would listen the way we listen, um, not, not you, sorry, presiding officer, but to uh, Fiona Hislop sitting here. If members listen to communities across Scotland, listen to exhausted nurses and carers, listening to the local government workers, wait for it, no, wait for it, local government workers who have seen 28,000 of their colleagues disappear over the last seven years, leaving them to deliver more with less. We have heard loud and clear that public services are under growing pressure. And I'll take the intervention Chair Mackay. from the Cabinet Secretary. I was, I was uh, listening very clearly to the list of demands that we've had this afternoon and then the specific request around health. The Labour Party has been clear, though, in expenditure that any of the resources you would raise would only be for local government. Why you don't you support the Scottish Government's uh, support for the National Health Service and above inflation increase for the NHS? Monica Lennon. Well, that's just simply not true. But I thought the Cabinet Secretary was coming to speak to talk about the fact that 28,000 jobs have been lost from local government. Where is the government's task force for local government? So when local government workers hear Derek Mackay claim, claim that councils are fairly funded, they can't believe their ears. Nine out of ten public sector job losses in Scotland have been in local government. How is that a fair deal, Cabinet Secretary? Presiding officer, we cannot continue to go on starving public services of resources. During the time we've been in this debate, teachers and school support staff have been looking after our learners, preparing the next generation of nurses, engineers and entrepreneurs. Carers are trudging through the snow to deliver personal care or an evening meal to older people in their own homes. It is councils who are responsible for many of the vital public services that are too often taken for granted. Social care for the elderly, responsibility for looked after young people, delivery of education, responsibility for our local roads, which are at a standstill, and leisure facilities, and so much more. Cuts to our councils mean that vital public servants have less resources to do their jobs, and we all suffer as a result. That's less money for gritting the road during icy weather, and older people are more likely to fall and end up in hospital. And as Ian Gray, well, as Ian Gray has said, and I noticed that the SNP heads went down at that point, including the education convener, <laughs> James Dornan, because when, when Ian Gray was on his feet, remind the chamber that under this government spending plans, there's been 1.2 billion taken out of education since 2010. How is that going to close the attainment gap or reduce inequality? And in my own region in central Scotland, just some of the proposals for savings due to budget cuts for the coming years include increasing primary one class sizes in the SNP-led South Lanarkshire Council and charging, um, increasing the charges for day centres for older people and increasing burial and cremation charges. 
So if they are determined to continue with their unfair funding, my question to the Cabinet Secretary is which of these vital services would the Scottish Government consider to be dispensable? The Cabinet Secretary told the Finance Committee that government is about choice and priorities, and I absolutely agree, just as I agree that austerity itself is a political choice. I think I've been a bit too generous with my intervention, so in closing, uh, in closing, presiding officer, this draft budget is timid, it's weak, and it fails to protect Scotland's vital public services. We have no confidence that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance intends to bring forward proposals that will deliver the investment our services need. It's for that reason that Labour cannot support the draft budget as it stands. A strong economy, Cabinet Secretary, needs strong public services. Scotland needs real change to deliver that, and a government that is willing to stand up for the public sector. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on public services. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 9925 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask anyone who objects to say so now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 9925. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 9925 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 9926 on subcommittee membership. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick again to move this motion on behalf of the Bureau? Moved. Thank you very much. So we come to decision time. And I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Derek Mackay is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser and Patrick Harvey would fall. The first question is that Amendment 9888.1 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend Motion 9886, sorry, 9888, in the name of James Kelly on protecting public services, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9888.1 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 61, no 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question, so I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Patrick Harvey will fall. So the next question is that amendment 9888.4 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of James Kelly, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 9888.4 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes, 29, no, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is the Amendment 9888.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of James Kelly, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 9888.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, 67, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 9888.2 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of James Kelly, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members will cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 9888.2 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, 27, no, 61. There were 35 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Motion 9888 in the name of James Kelly, as amended, on protecting public services be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9888 in the name of James Kelly as amended is yes, 67, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And the final question, order please. Order please. Okay. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. The final question is that motion 9926 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on subcommittee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And that concludes decision time. We we'll move now to members' business in the name of Joan McAlpine and Robert Burns. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.